I study how bees collect and transport pollen back to their hives. Pollen is the main source of protein in a bee's diet, so it's really important that they're able to collect enough of it for the hive. When they carry it, they mix it with nectar and um, carry it in the form of suspension, so solid particles and a liquid particle on their legs. So I've been studying the fluid properties of that uh, pellet that they form out of the suspension and how it adheres to the leg. And I used SEM, so scanning electron micrographs, to actually look at these pellets really, really close up and see the pollen grains in um, the nectar. The volume fraction, so the number of, of pollen particles per volume of this pellet, is a, a maximum for what is theoretically possible. Um, so it's really impressive that they're able, without even really thinking about it, they're able to maximize the number of pollen particles they could bring back to the, to the hive. I'm studying them from a fluids perspective as well, and I was able to measure the viscosity, so how thick the suspension is. And I found that the it, including the pollen in the nectar increases the viscosity uh, 10,000 times from just nectar alone, uh, which is good because if you think of something um, that has a low viscosity, so it flows really easily, it'd be hard to get it to stick to the leg. It wouldn't stay, which would be really bad news for the bee because it would spend all this time collecting pollen and then it would fall off. It'd be very sad. Uh, so, uh, and then from there, I looked at you know how strongly these pellets are um, adhere to the leg. Um, so I did this by uh, gluing a leg to a, just a slide and then gluing a wire to the pellet and pulling it off with an elastic string. So the elastic string acts like a spring, so you can measure the amount that this, this string deflects and then you can measure the force that way. Uh, and I found that um, the force to remove the basket is 24 times greater than any drag force a bee experiences while it's flying. Um, so again, good news because you know, the bee is not going to lose the thing it worked so hard um, to, uh, to, to fill up and bring back to the hive. Among the various uh, underwater vehicles that we develop, I was hired to develop one which looks like squids and octopuses. The reason being that these kind of animals are really cool, they are very good at swimming, they have a sport, amazing performances, and they do all these without having bones. So it's quite incredible, this thing, if you think about that, and if you were able to design a vehicle, really, that it's capable of matching the same kind of performances, at the same time not having rigid structure inside, really you could use it throughout a whole range of applications which right now common underwater vehicles cannot really uh, perform. Well, yeah, in, in fact, they look fairly biological. Yeah, uh, essentially they are like a hollow shell of silicon material, but there are many ways of designing that. Uh, the one we're using now is uh, this uh, pump and, uh, and the valve so that you can basically inflate this body with ambient fluid and then open the valve and release this uh, slug of fluid which propels the vehicle uh, forward. Uh, so it, really the design is very, very simple. What makes it complicated is really understanding the dynamics, how the elasticity of the body interacts with the fluid inside and outside, all these couple effects, which is really the, the amazing part of the work. For the past two years, I have been working on a problem which has been motivated by the Deepwater Horizon spill, and in particular we were looking on how the rotation of the Earth affects the dynamics of an oil plume. My experimental setup consists of a very large tank, which contains about one ton of water, and it is placed on a rotating turntable. We produce either salt water plumes or bubble plumes, and there is a cyclonic circulation which forms around the plume in the tank, and when the plume hits the bottom, it starts to spread laterally, and once it starts to spread laterally, the rotation inhibits its lateral spreading, so at some point the plume will undergo the so-called baroclinic instability. One of the critical points here that we're arguing is the importance of rotation of the Earth, and that is quite a big hypothesis. This is effectively a very small plume, it's like uh, it starts with a maybe a 50 centimeter source. At the top, it might be a few hundred meters maybe at the surface. So compared to a hurricane which fills the rotation of the Earth and which spans hundreds of kilometers, this is extremely small. So the main point that we realize in the experiments and in the numerical simulation is that because the fluid is drawn from further and further away, conservation of angular momentum forces then the rotation of the Earth to start playing a role. But this happens only after one rotation period. We try also in the consortium, we have a representative from BP, we have people who are in the remediation, uh, so 
those who are like the first people to respond when there is a crisis, when there is an emergency, and they want to um, uh, really uh, use this knowledge, all the information that we uh, start understanding better, so that then they can act appropriately and as effectively and as fast as possible.